My name is Martha Fitz. I'm an Extension Associate with the Chico County Lab for UAPB. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about farm safety. There are a number of things that you need to know on, on a farm pond, fish pond. You need to know about electrical safety, being sure you know where all your aerators are, your switch boxes, make sure you know where all wires are. If you're mowing or weed eating or anything of this nature, be sure and be aware because we don't want anybody to wind up electrocuted. Also, when you're loading fish out, be sure you know where your overhead wires are because there's far too many accidents where they get tangled up in overhead wires when they're doing their booms. Also, on your equipment, you want to make sure that you know how to operate the equipment safely. Most equipment is equipped nowadays with rollover protection on tractors in case you make a mistake and go too far over the edge on a pond. Also, you need to be sure when you have PTOs, which is where you hook up some of your aerators, be sure and not wear, have any kind of loose clothing or any kind of jewelry or anything of that nature, long hair that would get caught in there because that's that's an accident waiting to happen. Also, be sure on your ponds, be sure you know your area, know where you're going around your ponds because the last thing you want to do is at night to run off a pond, run off in a pond. Also, a lot of our older ponds need some reworking, so you need to be careful and know which pond levees might be in the process of caving in. One of our newer situations we have nowadays, we have what we call our split pond aquaculture systems, where we have our fish on one end of a pond and a levee separating it from the rest of the pond. When we do an aeration and we do a water exchange, we also have uh, some issues with our water creating the current. I've created a little demonstration to show you today where if you were to happen to fall into a pond, this is your little fish farmer here. Something happens and you fall in, you'll go right through a, you could go through a culvert because most of our culverts on one side have a grate. So you could get caught up into a culvert with a, a huge amount of water going through constantly. And this is something that you may want to think about having a grate if you're a farmer on both sides of your culverts. And also whether you have a screw pump or a paddle wheel system, you may want to look at fencing these things off, putting up some kind of a railing to keep people from falling in because this is another situation that could uh, cause some very bad accidents. We don't have a, we have a, a safety video video this year for you, a new one on DVD. We also have our posters and things. And another thing you need to be thinking about for OSHA's benefit is having some kind of a form filled out where your employee has said they actually saw the safety video and you do have the safety material out. So this is something that you, we all need to be aware of and we all know that it's always better to be safe than to be sorry. Thank you. All right, we're here this morning to talk about uh, using alternative feeds for bait fish and for catfish. Um, feeds, the cost of feeds has gone really high in the past few years. Uh, even traditional ingredients like soybean meal have gotten prohibitively expensive. So we've had to look at uh, other uh, agriculture byproducts mostly as alternative feed sources. And most of what we've looked at are byproducts of the corn industry. So we've worked uh, extensively with uh, distillers dried grains with solubles and also with corn gluten feed. Uh, we've done this both with channel catfish and with bait fish. With uh, the catfish, we found that the, uh, the corn products in general will perform as well as soybean meal diets. We do have to add some extra ingredients like certain amino acids that are lacking in the corn uh, and also some sources of minerals that are not going to be present in the corn. But still, even with those additions, the diets with the corn products tend to be less expensive. And mostly the fish performance is the same on those diets. Uh, we also look at uh, different protein levels in the diets. The lower the protein, the less expensive the diet will be. Uh, mainly, the bigger fish do just as well on a 28 or 32 percent protein diet. In some cases, the fingerlings do better on the 32 percent. Uh, but since catfish production is a two-year cycle, there's a chance that the smaller fish would catch up in the second year and that the 28s would still be okay for the whole cycle. With uh, the bait fish, the goals are a little bit different. We don't want a really big bait fish, a small bait fish is ideal size. Uh, so we look at, uh, we can look at some even lower protein diets in bait fish, like a 22% diet. And we're looking at the same alternative ingredients in bait fish diets, just because the corn byproducts are available in large quantities and they're less expensive. With the bait fish also, the fish density is a big issue. When they're at a lower density, they typically, they grow faster, but of course you have fewer fish at the end of the study. So we compared uh, three different 20 
22% protein diets with some alternative ingredient, ingredients, the corn products, versus soybean meal, the main protein source we normally use. And then we had one diet at the higher protein level. We found with the, the bait fish that the higher protein diets did stimulate growth better than the lower protein diets, uh, and that the lower fish density also was effective in growing a bigger fish. So we have to look at the economics of that to see what works best for the bait fish. With, uh, with the catfish, we've also looked at alternative lipids or fats. We, uh, we want catfish to be healthier in terms of their, their lipid composition, like salmon are high in omega-3s, which are good for you. Catfish don't have that, and we really don't want to put marine oils in their diets. It would be, make them more expensive, and uh, we don't want to use fish oil. But there are other healthy fats, like conjugated linoleic acid, that can be produced uh, from non-fish sources and also can be combined with uh, traditional plant oils like soybean oil. So we've tested an oil produced in Fayetteville that's uh, it's a soybean oil that it's high in conjugated linoleic acid. And we've tested that all the way through to food-sized catfish, and they grow just as well on it. Uh, and in taste tests, they taste the same as traditional catfish fed on regular diets. Then another uh, item that we're looking at is prebiotics. Those are indigestible carbohydrates that stimulate the good gut microflora. That helps uh, with feed conversion efficiency and also it helps stimulate the immune response. We'd like to use those. Those are natural products uh, rather than antibiotics or other growth promotants we're trying to get out of the diets. And we've seen some uh, success with those both in bait fish and we're, we're working on it with catfish more. It's been a little more difficult with catfish, but we're still working uh, out the details for catfish. I'm Larry Dorman, Extension Aquaculture Specialist, UAPB. I'm located at the Lake Village Fish Disease Lab, which is operated through UAPB. Uh, I'm talking today on the catfish trematode. The title is Nail the Snail. This year, the catfish trematode has reappeared in the catfish in that area. Uh, it had been gone from about 2008. Uh, we had one farm in particular, eight ponds. Uh, all eight ponds were severely infected enough that the farmer had to basically let the fish go. Uh, there was no salvaging for uh, the catfish that were infected. Uh, the problem is so severe, the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine at Mississippi State University, very interested, and researchers spent a good portion of their summer studying that situation. Uh, from our previous studies from 2006 and 2007, our results showed that in southeast Arkansas, 22.5% of the ponds were infected with a catfish trematode. Uh, of those uh, ponds, about 25% of the fish in those ponds were infected. Infection rates ranged from light to heavy, but average just about moderate, which moderate I classify as about 10 to 20 of the uh, trematodes per catfish. The problem with the catfish trematode is uh, it affects the fish's production uh, in the pond. Uh, Mississippi State research showed that as little as uh, a light infection, which that's 10 uh, of the infective units per fish, uh, caused reduction in the fish feeding and production of the pond about 15 percent. If the infection goes to heavy, uh, that can affect the uh, production in a pond by 85 uh, percent. Research that Dr. Carol Engel conducted here at UAPB shows that ponds that had heavy uh, infection of the catfish trematode uh, showed an economic loss of over $700 per acre. So this will put a farmer out of business in a little no time. To uh, treat the catfish trematode, you got to understand the life cycle involved here. Uh, we're dealing with an adult that lives in the digestive tract of the white pelican. As we know, the white pelican is protected under uh, migratory bird treaties. Uh, we can control the numbers of them, but you know it would be unlawful to actually kill one of the things. Uh, the adult lives, like as mentioned, in the digestive tract. The bird defecates in the pond. The uh, if the bird is infected, uh, there's infected eggs in that fish. Or in the, I'm sorry, the bird feces. Uh, the infected uh, unit goes and finds the ram's horn snail, which is our inter the first intermediate host. Undergoes massive amount of reproduction in the ram's horn snail. It releases another little infective unit by the tens of thousands which infects the catfish. Uh, when it infects the catfish, it penetrates the body organs, the heart, liver, uh, kidney, such. Um, and the reaction is the fish just does not feed, doesn't feel like feeding. We do have some treatments, however. First thing we need to do is correctly identify the ram's horn snail, which I have examples in the lab if somebody wanted to come by and look. It's a little snail that's shaped like the cinnamon bun. You can pick 
up at Chipley's Donuts or such places that. Uh, the next thing we want to do is look at the fish. Uh, I will look at the fish and then take my uh, scalpel, open up the little lesion, and uh, look under the microscope for the trematode. Uh, it's a little larva. It'll look like it's two inches long under the microscope, which in effect is probably an eighth of inch long in nature. Uh, as far as uh, treatment of the ponds, we suggest copper sulfate around the pond levee at about uh, 10 pounds per each 250 linear feet of levy. Hydrated lime is also used at about 50 to 75 pounds per 100 uh, linear feet of levy. And finally, we suggest the use of the black carp, stock those at about 20 to 30 per acre, replacing about one third of those each year. These things will seek the carp out, will actually eat the carp, and can eliminate the problem. Uh, we also suggest that you have a bird scaring program to keep those pelicans ran off the best you can. Uh, permits can be attained from the animal damage control people. All right, good morning. This demonstration and this presentation is about hybrid catfish technologies. What we've seen in the catfish industry is that we've seen about 20 percent of our farms starting to stock hybrid catfish. This is a cross between the channel and the blue catfish. It brings a lot of different advantages to the farm. One of those advantages is that it grows faster. Now the traditional way that farmers have stocked and raised hybrid catfish is to stock seven inch hybrid catfish fingerlings at about 4,000 per acre. What happens though when a hatchery produces hybrid catfish fingerlings, not all of them are seven inch, some are five inch. Well there's a big question about whether those five inch fish that are cheaper to buy but are those five inch fish going to reach market size in a single year is one of the big questions. And what to do with them? Or are they just runts and are going to be too small and are not going to perform well in a pond? So this study was designed to address that question. We stocked five ponds with five inch hybrid catfish fingerlings stocked at 4,000 per acre. We stocked five ponds with seven inch fingerlings at 4,000 per acre like the standard is in the industry today. And then in five other ponds, we stocked 4,000 per acre of five inch fish and another 4,000 per acre of seven inch fish in the same ponds. What we've seen so far is that the seven inch fish stocked at 4,000 per acre did reach market size. We completely harvested those ponds about two weeks ago. Fish were beautiful. They were two pounds like we expected. The seven inch fish that were mixed in with the five inch fish also reached market size, were also two pounds per acre, and we harvested those out. We left the smaller ones in, but we harvested out the, mar the market sized fish a couple of weeks ago. From sampling, what we've seen is that these five inch fish that were stocked by themselves in a pond back on August 14th averaged about a pound. Now that means that they should be very close to market size. We expect to look at them next week and we expect to harvest this treatment in a couple of weeks because they'll have hit market size. Now the five inch fish that were stocked with the seven inch fish in the same ponds, these fish are running about two tenths of a pound smaller than the five inch fish that were stocked by themselves in the pond. We think that these five inch fish that were stocked with the seven inch fish are not going to reach market size this year. So we'll harvest those ponds and work up all of the data and then we're going to stock them back in the ponds, hold them over the winter, monitor survival, monitor growth, and then in the spring we're going to come back and stock another five, 4,000 per acre of five inch fish in the spring. These fish that by fall going into the winter ought to be about 1.1, 1.2 pounds ought to reach market size by perhaps late May. We plan to harvest all of them out. So the big question then is when we harvest those out next spring or next May, the remaining five inch fish, will they hit market size by the end of next year? If they do, will have produced three crops in two years. And so what we're going to look at at the end of this study is the economics of it. A five inch fish is a lot cheaper, is four to six cents a piece cheaper, which can be a lot when you're stocking out an entire farm. 
is this growth and getting possibly three crops in two years going to offset the slower growth of this size of fish as compared to seven inch fish. So we'll do the economics and do that. Some of these fish over here are showing the size, the two pound market size of the, that the seven inch fish reached. And this is a smaller size of the five inch fish that was understocked with the larger fish in the ponds. Hi, my name's Anita Kelly and I'm a Lone Oak um, Extension agent and I work at the Fish Disease Lab up there and today we're talking about getting the most money uh, for the use of the chemicals that you put in your pond. We frequently get farmers coming in and complaining that the chemical that they're using is not working or it's too powerful. For instance, they'll have uh, a, a massive fish kill once they apply a chemical to the pond. And what we've discovered in going out and watching them is that actually the application method is key. Most farmers will do one of three things. They either have somebody walk along the edge of the pond and spray the chemical in, or they'll have it in a big container on the back of a, a truck and they can actually spray it out over the pond. Or the third way is, is they'll just take a scoop and scoop it out and throw it over the pond as they walk along the edge. All these methods are okay, but they don't evenly distribute the chemical throughout the pond and usually the center doesn't get any. Another problem is that if you're treating a 40 acre pond and you only apply a small amount to the edge of the pond, that creates a big problem because now you're applying about 10,000 times the amount of chemical you should be within a certain area. And this can lead to fish kills. So what we've come up with is a simple design that is basically based on some old information that they used to have back in the 1960s. And these are chemical treatment boats. And I'd like to take you back here and kind of explain how this boat works. This is nothing more than a flat bottom boat. And it's equipped with just a couple of key things. One, it has a pump. This pump does nothing but draw water from the pond itself. And as it pumps the water through, it basically reaches a T. And those two, um, that T then, each end of it goes out to one of the arms on the boat here. This white barrel that we have here is actually where the chemical mix is at. And with this chemical mix, we have a, um, basically a, a small pump that basically will put out a little bit of chemical with the water as it goes through. And as the chemicals distributed, it's distributed out behind the boat through each one of these little uh, tubes that are attached to the back. Now this does a couple of nice things. One, as you're going along and treating the pond, it actually is putting the chemical at the bottom. And the chemical then can rise up through the water column. Some of the chemicals that we use in uh, aquaculture actually will float on top. So if you spray it on top, it's going to stay there and it won't go all the way through to the bottom and treat all of the water column. So this is a good way to get things all the way through. The other thing too is that you can add a dye, a fluorescent dye that they use for checking sewer lines to see if there's a leak. It's an inert substance. It won't hurt your fish and it won't hurt the chemical that you're applying to the pond. And it'll give you a nice green or red color that follows behind the boat. And you can actually tell where you've been on the pond as you go back and forth. Um, this takes a little bit longer to put the chemical out, but it does a much better job. It also does a much better job when you're looking at applying it to weeds that might be out into the middle of the pond where you possibly can't get your spray to go. Uh, one of the things that we don't have with this that row crop farmers do have is they have a little chart that tells them that if they're going so fast on the tractor and they have this size spray nozzle that they're going to put out a certain amount per acre foot. Unfortunately, nobody's been able to figure that out for uh, the chemical boat yet, but we hope somebody will be able to soon. This is a much better method than just spraying or actually um, just throwing the, ma the material out into the pond, and we highly recommend that. Thank you. I'm Drew Mitchell, and I'm serving as an interim uh, fish health specialist at uh, UAPB, and I've been asked to speak on an emerging aeromonas, uh, which is a bacterial disease problem of uh, channel catfish. The aeromonas have been with us for a number of years. Uh, the Germans isolated it from fish in probably the 18, late 1870s. Uh, Dr. Fred Myers in uh, Stuttgart uh, worked on it uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, and that work resulted in the first medicated feed uh, that was used in fish ponds. Uh, that was teramycin. Uh, 
The Aramonas we have now is a hot new strain, probably from Asia, that uh, has been uh, killing fish, a number of fish in Alabama and, uh, and, and in a few ponds in uh, Arkansas and Mississippi. Uh, it causes a lot of hemorrhaging or redness or bleeding in the uh, uh, underneath the skin surface of the fish, in the muscle, and in the intestinal tract, visceral fat, and liver of the fish. Um, we have medicated feeds available. Uh, there's a lot of problems. The, overall, the medicated feeds are very expensive, about $1,000 a ton. Some are impalatable, or, or fish don't like to eat them very much. It seems like sometimes a fish would rather uh, not eat them and die than eat them. And, and uh, they're, they're also limited effectiveness. Some have res a lot of resistance buildup to them. And uh, they're uh, put in a, one is put in a sinking formula, uh, sinking feed formulation. And catfish are used to eating a floating feed formulation. And so if the sinking feed hits the water, the catfish are a little lethargic because they're sick. When they get there, that feed is already sunk to the bottom and, be and is not available. One of the feeds is only effective if another disease or, or is only legal if another disease organism is present and that is aquaflor and that can only be used legally to treat columnaris. So what do we do? We, we try to prevent the spread of uh, the disease. Uh, our poster child for spread is, is another disease, bacterial disease. In 1970, it first occur, uh, uh, appeared in a, uh, in a farm near DeWitt, Arkansas, and within 30 years had spread throughout the whole nation. We want to prevent that if possible. So we suggest farmers don't bring any uh, diseased fish uh, or bring any fish from a, a diseased farm uh, and avoid uh, the whole area where, dis uh, where disease outbreaks occur. Uh, we suggest that they um, disinfect their equipment, uh, sains, and uh, we also suggest that they um, uh, steam spray their their transport equipment. The best thing is to not go outside. Uh, if, if the farmer has his own equipment, that's the best situation. That leaves us to the final consideration, and that's the environmental control. Most of the disease that we're aware of occurs in ponds with deep sumps. Occasionally, it occurs in shallow ponds. So we have to ask a question. Do we eliminate the deep pond aspect because it occurs in shallow ponds, or do we ask and say, when is a shallow pond like a deep pond, or under what conditions does a shallow pond have some of the characteristics of a deep pond? And I think that's the approach. And so we're looking at uh, potential of low oxygen areas or hydrogen sulfide, uh, which is produced in the bottom muds. Both of these can act as stressors and allow the disease organism to take hold uh, once it's present. Because if you put the disease organism in on fish uh, that are healthy and the water's in good shape and everything, uh, the disease won't take. So there's a little more than just having the disease organism present. You also need the stressors. So we're looking at that. And this work has not been done, and we hope uh, next season that uh, some of this will be done. Hi, my name is George Selden. I'm with the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff Aquaculture Fishery Center. And uh, today we'll be discussing uh, some new strategies to try to control submerged weeds in bait fish ponds. Um, been working on this issue for about three years. The first two years we looked at uh, a particular chemical, it's fluoridone, which is, is sold as sonar. And we, we tried to get a really do low dose added at the time of the pond filling. We were able to get it down to about five parts per billion, which is about a half ounce per acre foot, which is really low and very affordable, around you know seven bucks an acre foot. The problem with fluoridone is, is they're seeing a lot of resistance in Florida. Um, uh, to the plants and, and we can't have that other because we don't want to lose the herbicide. So this year we looked at uh, uh, some rice herbicides, some rice pre-emergent herbicides that would be applied to the pond when it was dry. Um, the, the five herbicides, then germoxin was added at the request of a farmer. Um, all five of these are systemic herbicide, which means that they will move, they have very long uh, half-lives and they, they, last, they, they will move throughout the plant to the point where they they need to uh, work on the plant. Um, 
anyway, we tried all five of them and we, we did a, a spraying of a 10 foot strip around the outside of the pond and then the pond would be filled. Um, we think it worked, it, it seemed to work pretty good, but I just, because of the nature of how we did it and the nature of the ponds, um, I can't guarantee at this point that it worked, but it seemed to give us some good indication. Um, the goal, of course, is, is to bring the cost down, so we'll try to use lower rates, um, and then we'll keep rotating the herbicides, and then we can deal with the resistance issues that won't come from that. Um, but hopefully we'll do this again next year and, and, and we'll get some better results and hopefully we can try to find a way to control what's going on, try to control the submerged plants that the uh, bait fish farmers have to deal with. Uh, my name is Matt Rexitar. I'm a verification specialist here. Uh, and basically what we've been studying, what this talk is going to be about is uh, split ponds. Uh, now with uh, problems in the catfish industry, with growing prices of feed, uh, lower costs for catfish, um, we've been forced to develop new technologies to hopefully increase efficiency. Uh, one of these methods is the split pond uh, production system. Uh, basically what they do is uh, take a typical uh, 10, 14 acre pond, and uh, we section it off, build a levee, split it to about a 15% uh, percent split, uh, and in that 15% section, we're going to grow and culture our catfish. Um, Basically, the other 85% uh, of the pond is going to serve as a waste treatment area. Uh, now, we use a, a paddle wheel such as this one, uh, and there's culvert, five-foot culverts that run under the levee, and basically, we're going to circulate the water uh, through the fish, uh, and then in this 85% of the pond uh, is where all the uh, waste treatment is going to happen. Uh, it's going to increase your oxygen production because it's going to allow more uh, algal particles uh, to get access to nutrients in sunlight. Um, now, this is beneficial for a few reasons. Um, one, by having a more nutrients uh, per algae are going to allow the ammonia to, you know, disappear, dissipate a lot quicker. It's going to serve sort of as a sink for that. Um, now we've been testing out designs for paddle wheels to help move the water, uh, and that one of those, as you see pictured, is is the uh, Hikus water wheel. Uh, and then what that does is, uh, using a five horsepower motor, uh, we can move about 15,000 gallons per minute. Um, and using a seven and a half horsepower motor, we can move uh, upwards of 20,000 gallons a minute. Um, this is also essential uh, to create a flow in the pond, the catfish really love swimming against the flow, and we use these hybrid catfish, uh, which is a cross between a channel and a blue catfish. Um, and these blue catfish, uh, you know, they love swimming in currents. They love they love that water. So you'll you can actually see them all kind of schooling together, swimming against that current. Uh, other benefits of having a split pond. Um, is obviously a smaller area, makes it a lot easier to sane uh, and harvest your fish, um, as well as treat for diseases. Uh, and then at night, when that oxygen uh, drops down, you can uh, aerate those fish a lot easier. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there was a lot of realized benefits with this system. So what we did this year is we've had a lot of farmers with interest who uh, put forth their money and, you know, installed these uh, operations on their farm. Uh, now, I've been closely monitoring these, everything from water quality uh, to uh, growth and things like that. Um, and what we've noticed is that these fish uh, stocked at a lot higher densities than normal uh, do grow very well. Uh, so your typical traditional earthen pond, uh, a lot of farmers grow between six and 8,000, uh, stock between 6,000 and 8,000 head per acre. Uh, and now with these uh, split ponds, um, you can stock upwards of 15,000 um, and still get pretty good growth um, without any water quality problems. Um, even late in the summer when we've got 160,000 pounds stocked in a two acre area, we still have zero ammonia in these systems, which is pretty remarkable. Um, now all the benefits uh, of the systems haven't been realized yet, uh, but that's why we're doing research, trying to make improvements, try to figure out what the best parameters are for building these things. Um, so we've got a lot of people working on that and, and you know, ponds continue to go in, but we, you know, we, we do caution people on putting them in. It is, it is a substantial investment, uh, which we've also determined about between thirty dollars and $40,000 to put one of these systems in uh, or convert one of your ponds to a split pond system. Uh, so it is a big investment, uh, and we're trying to quickly figure out everything you know, that's going to make you know, the most optimal conditions for growing these catfish, uh, you know, reduce your food conversion rate so you can actually benefit from installing this and actually have a payback uh, or get a return on your money. Um, now, um, another th another thing, if you actually come over here and look at this video, um, you'll see right here we've got these screen structures uh, that David Hike has designed, and what they do is they ho they can help contain the f the fish in this small uh, fish shell, as we call it, uh, and then it's got these wing walls, uh, which basically help direct the flow uh, into and out of the split pond. Um, now these screens, uh, you know, do create some problems, so they do get clogged, so you do have to maintain them. Uh, but we've also got an oxygen monitoring system that you see that buoy out in the water, and what it does is that um, 
under five parts per million, those paddle wheel aerators will go on to help, you know, get water or oxygen for the fish. Uh, and then you see that Hycus water wheel. There's another buoy on the other side in the waste treatment area that will go on at uh, five parts per million. So you're going to start circulating the water when it gets good and uh, good water quality, good oxygen. And it's gonna, it, fish are really going to benefit and thrive in these systems. So um, like I said, it's, we're still in the preliminary stages. Uh, but uh, you know we're doing everything I can to really monitor these ponds and figure out w what's happening in them. Why why are these fish doing so well and how can we improve the situation for them? So, good morning. My name is Scott Styles. I'm extension economist with the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture, and I'm talking with folks on the on the, at the field day today about uh, commodity prices, and, uh, corn and soybean prices in particular. Um, uh, certainly, a dynamic that's changed and affected the catfish industry has been the, the introduction. Of, of biofuels as, as part of the usage for corn and soybeans over the over the past five to ten years and we've gone from traditionally using corn and soybeans as just a feed and, and fuel commodity or a, or a feed and food commodity to a, a fuel commodity as well so it certainly changed uh, how the commodities have used and it certainly made commodity prices more volatile uh, over time particularly in the last five years another thing that's changed uh, the dynamics is emerging market demand, uh, particularly from China. China has uh, been a consistent buyer of our soybeans, and their demand growth uh, continues to grow year after year, uh, two to four million tons a year uh, for soybeans in particular. Uh, and that has certainly been uh, something that's that's uh, created more volatility and, and rising prices in soybeans. So today we're talking about uh, why we are at record high price levels for corn and soybeans. And that's for a couple of reasons. It's it's high demand for commodities for biofuel use. It's high demand from emerging markets, and it's also uh, weather related as well. In early 2012, we had a, a drought uh, impacts in Brazil and Argentina uh, that impacted uh, their, particularly their soybean yields, and that was followed by uh, the worst drought in, in at least 50 years uh, here in the United States that have greatly impacted our yields as well. So. So supplies of corn and soybeans uh, remain at, at historically low levels here in the United States uh, and prices are, at, are have reached record high levels uh, late this summer in, in August and September uh, for both of those commodities. So uh, that's an issue that we're going to continue to deal with for some months. Uh, we're going to continue to see high, record high commodity prices for the balance of this year and into the first quarter of 2013 and we may not see any relief. Uh, in, in these record high soybean prices until uh, the next South American harvest, which will be, uh, which will hit the market in February or March of, uh, of 2013. Uh, corn prices will uh, are expected to remain high at these at these uh, record high levels and and may uh, that may persist until the 2013 harvest here in the United States. So uh, acreage for both of these crops is, is expected to increase in the U.S. next year and 20 uh, for both corn and soybeans. And uh, with decent weather and a return to trend line yields, we should see some rebuilding and ending stocks uh, for both those commodities and, and some uh, expectation of lower prices a year from now. Hi, I'm Ella Thompson, a graduate student here at UAPB, working with Dr. Rebecca Lockman. Today we have um, crappie stocking for small impoundments. Crappie is actually the second most popular sport fish in Arkansas. So it makes sense that people would want to stock them in their personal ponds for their own fishing. The problem being though, is that crappie will start reproducing at a young age and stop growing. Therefore, no trophy fish. Now there are probably about three or four ways you can go about solving this problem. One of the ways is by stocking sterile fish. We get sterile fish through a hybridization process, a triploid process, or a hybrid triploid process. The triploid process is fairly easy to understand. Normally in a cell, you have, normally you have a diploid cell. You have an egg and a sperm, which are haploids. They get together to make a diploid, and they have two chromosomal pairs, making a normal cell. But in triploid, we treat the cell before the second mitosis division to keep three chromosomal pairs in there. And so we have this 3N cell, and this makes it very difficult for the animal to reproduce. In 
our hatchery, we took a black crappie and white crappie, fertilized the eggs, and then put the eggs into a steel cylinder at 600, I mean 6,000 psi for three minutes. This, mm, the eggs are then allowed to grow into full adults. Although there are some problems with the triploid crappie being, uh, <laughs> problems with the triploid crappie being some def deformities leading to high mortality. And Brandon's going to tell us about the other ways. Hi, and I'm Brandon Bomber, um, another graduate student here at UAPB, and I'm going to pick up where Ella left off and talk about hybrid crappie a little bit. Um, the hybrid crappie that we chose to use was a black by white hybrid cross, and the reason we decided to do that is because black crappie tend to be more hardy than white, white crappie, so we figured our survival may be better. Um, some possible management solutions to stocking these fish are we could have a bass bluegill pond, bass bluegill crappie pond, for example, and have a lot of intermediate sized bass that eat all the little crappie when they reproduce very highly. Um, if you look over here, can you show this? Um, if you can see the fish very well, there's actually one hybrid fish and one pure black crappie in there. And it is very hard to tell the difference between these. The, the difference between these two species. Um, so basically, without the use of a blood test or some type of genetic testing, to be able to tell if you have a hybrid fish or a pure fish is very difficult. Um, so thank you for your time.